It is a great honor once again to welcome back to our show best-selling author, world-renowned speculator, libertarian philosopher, Mr. Doug Casey. You can learn more about Doug by going to his website, internationalman.com. He's also got a podcast called Doug Casey's Take. It's on YouTube. I've listened to it several times. It's fantastic. Mr. Casey, welcome back to the show. Call me Doug, if you would. We're friends, I think, Ryan. Yes, and uh, thank you. And I, I consider you a, a teacher and somebody who I, I admire greatly. So uh, thank you, Doug, for welcome, being back to the show. Okay. So I guess in this past week, Americans had something called an election, if you want to call it that, in the country. And I don't know. I, I wonder, from your perspective, did this thing have any impact? Because of all the takeaways I, I, I looked at this, I cannot believe that anyone for the life of me would allow any person that prevented them from being with their families when they were dying and by saying goodbye to their families on Zoom would allow that person at any anywhere near a public uh, office. I'm just surprised. I'm really just surprised that, that alone that that would not cause a major surge of people to kind of wake up or to to you know, kind of have a backlash, but it seemed like people were totally okay with it. What's your take on it? And did this uh, recent election have any impact or will it have any impact on America going forward? <laughs> oh God, there are so many things that we can talk about that you brought up there. Um, but the character of America has been changing rapidly uh, over the last couple of decades and not for the better. Uh, it's amazing to me how supine, how bovine uh, the average American has become. What do I attribute that to? Is it the fact that something like 25% of Americans are supposedly on psychoactive medical drugs like Zoloft or uh, Halcyon or uh, Ritalin? And there's about 100 of them. That could be part of it. Uh, they're kind of like the the walking dead. They're, they're <laughs> they are of, yeah, highly functional zombies yeah. from that point of view. That could be one thing. Certainly another thing is the fact that uh, so many, is it a majority? I'm not sure, of uh, high school graduates go on to college uh, in lockstep. And the colleges universally are controlled by wokesters, by, by Marxists. There are more Marxists on US college campuses than there are in all of Russia. And kids are stupidly paying huge amounts of money, huge amounts of money to be indoctrinated with uh, really poisonous ideas, but that's had an effect too. That's part of it. Um, so uh, what's going to happen next? <clears throat> At this point, and I guess all the precincts aren't in, as they say, but um, look, we've had uh, the Americans uh, elected Jacobins in 2020. Now, excuse me, I had a piece of toast for breakfast and Perhaps a sip of coffee will wash down that crumb from my throat. Let's hope so. Um, I don't trust the election process in this country. I grew up in Chicago. And in those days, when Kennedy beat Nixon, we all knew that it was because there was a precinct that gave the election to Kennedy and it was bought and paid for. This was well known among everybody in Chicago. It was... Uh, things have gotten way out of control since then. Um, the Democrats and the Republicans both cheat, but the, re but the Democrats are much, much better at it than the Republicans. So um, it's out of control at this point. I mean, all this nonsense about democracy and it, it, it's completely meaningless. So uh, I agree with you. They keep on saying democracy needs to be preserved. I'm like, well, what is 
really democracy? What are you trying to preserve anyway? What exactly? What what, what exactly are you trying to preserve? It's like mob rule. That's exactly. Really I don't, yeah, exactly. I I don't believe in democracy as a ruling principle. Uh, people don't define their words very well, and what you really want in a country is freedom. You want liberty. You want the right to control your own life. And people conflate that uh, and confuse it with democracy, which is majority rule. But uh, I don't want to be ruled by anybody, a minority yeah. or a majority. I mean, the whole idea behind this country is really self-rule. That's what personal freedom is about. So people have the wrong idea about almost everything. It's like what Mark Twain said. The problem isn't what people don't know. It's what people think they know that just ain't so. And that's true about almost everything to do with politics today. In fact, the whole world revolves around politics today. It shouldn't. I mean, politics should be a, a minor and inconsequential part of our daily lives, but it's become overwhelming. Why is that? Because the government controls about half the economy. The government has uses that huge amount of money that it takes in, not much of it from taxes anymore in relative terms, not much of it from borrowing anymore. It's printed money, which is a further problem. And it uses that money to create more rules and regulations and laws that bedevil people. No, the US is going through a what amounts to a color revolution, the type of thing that we foisted on a lot of countries uh, in the old world. Uh, the same people are foisting it on the American people today. So, uh, so what is the end? What does that look like? What is the end result? Let's say in five years, because one thing um, we've had a trends forecaster, Martin Armstrong, on before, it, and he is he said this so many times. He said the U.S. is going to won't exist by twenty thirty two. He said by 2020, you're probably going to start seeing the wheels come off. He said, because you have two factions of the country that completely hate each other. And quite frankly, I mean, if you look at these two political, supposed political ideologies, which I don't think they're very different, I think they, they just want to control each other. I just, you know, I don't understand how people can live uh, in the same country if they don't have any of the same values. And if you believe in freedom, I mean, you're like in the ultra, ultra minority. I, it, so it's, it's just weird. So do you think that... Um, the U.S. is going to split up, and what does the color revolution look like to you, at well, least going forward for the next five years? Well, I've been saying that <clears throat> for years, actually, that the uh, ultimate fate of the U.S. is to uh, break up into regions. I mean, ideally, I mean, my ideal scenario is to see the world itself break up into like seven billion regions. It'd be wonderful. Yeah, exactly, where everyone basically owns and controls himself. But uh, let's say that's not going to happen. But uh, the smaller the political subdivision, the better. Uh, look, uh, this whole idea of democracy, uh, which sounds good uh, on the surface, where it, it started in ancient Athens, where you basically knew all the other people that were voting on issues of the day. Well, one of the problems is that the issues that people think they can vote on uh, shouldn't be issues. I mean, my idea, if you're going to have a government, if you're going to have a government, okay, but we, which I don't believe is a, a necessary thing, or frankly, even a good thing, we can talk about mm -hmm. that, because that's, uh, that's actually an important issue that uh, nobody broaches. We'll, but we'll, 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 that for we'll talk about that next. Sure. Government government is pure congealed force. It's about coercion. Uh, it's not about friendly cooperation. Government comes out of the barrel of a gun, as Mao Te Sung said. So if you're going to have a government at all, and considering the government is pure force, it's its nature, uh, you want to limit it as much as possible to... Oh, or you limit it totally to containing force in society. What does that mean? That means having police to protect you from force domestically, 
perhaps having an army to protect you from forests from without the borders, and a court system to allow you to adjudicate disputes without resorting to force. That's it. Uh, the government shouldn't be doing anything else. It shouldn't be supplying schools. It, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't have any of the hundreds of agencies that it has passing out hundreds of billions of dollars uh, for all kinds of almost always corrupt reasons. But uh, we've gotten so far down the road at this point that uh, you can't turn this around. It's uh, It started out as a little snowball rolling down the hill, and now it's turned into a giant avalanche that's unstoppable. And it's about to smash the village at the bottom of the valley. And I don't know what's going to happen in the next few years. The only prediction I can really make with any confidence is that we're going to be looking at chaos. Okay. And do you think that it's going to be um, a, a an economic event where inflation will just be so high that we'll have so many people not being able to afford the basic necessities that will ultimately you know, cause people that normally would be peaceful to take up arms because they have no other choice because they're so desperate? I wonder, if, do you think that would be causing, or do you think that the um, the hatred between political ideologies will just get to the point where it'll just be so intense that people will physically start attacking each other that the civility will no longer be there? Because at least I've observed in the last 10 years, the viciousness, the verbal viciousness has gotten so much. And I always think that prior to any violence that always occurs, it's how people communicate. And I think that the the facilitation, the verbal use has gotten so deplorable and so vicious that I think violence is kind of inevitable. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Well, it's clear to me that the red people and the blue people really don't like each other. In fact, they actually hate each other. They don't understand each other. They can't communicate with each other, even if they're members of the same family, even if they have known each other most of their lives. So it's uh, it's really gotten to that point. Uh, the only real solution to it, practical solution, I think, is uh, to uh, for the country to split up into regions. It's uh, uh, we've seen recently that uh, you know more pe pe people that think and believe a certain way are tending to move to states like Florida. Yeah. And uh, I think that that uh, that's that's a trend that's going to build. It, it really is. And a lot of people are moving out of the country entirely. A lot of people are renouncing their citizenships because an American citizenship, which used to be a uh, which used to be quite valuable, uh, has now become a net liability. Uh, most Americans are unaware of the fact that. The United States is the, it's not the only country in the world, but it's the only major country in the world that insists on taxing you uh, as if you lived here with small exemptions, even if you never set foot back in the country again. If I move to Mexico today, uh, I'd better file my tax return every year or um, be prepared to pay the consequences of not doing so. And this is a major liability. That, that's even if you renounce your citizenship? Absolutely. You still, to, you still have to pay taxes to the U.S. even if you renounce your citizenship? No. Oh. Uh, if if you move out of the U.S., okay. you have to pay taxes Jeez. with about a $100,000 exemption uh, for the rest of your life. That's basically, the, that's basically the rule. So being an American is very expensive. And that's not all. There are lots of forms that you have to fill out uh, with onerous penalties. We're talking about uh, long present terms and uh, uh, six-figure fines, uh, disclosing your financial assets and comings and goings. Uh, uh, so it's it's uh, being an American is uh, is a real pain today. What are the advantages of being an American? Well, let me think. They don't really hijack airliners anymore or the like. But uh, if they did, I can promise you that uh, the hijackers are unlikely to say, uh, okay, uh, all the uh, Bolivians and Latvians line up over there, we're going to shoot you. But it would not be unlikely that they say all the Americans line up over there, we're going to shoot you. Because uh, 
the US is the only country in the world that has bases in a hundred other countries in the world. And uh, you know, it's, it's not like the natives uh, love the GIs who are passing out chocolates and nylons anymore. I mean, they see them as you know, foreign alien invaders. So it's, uh, now this country's become quite out of control. It's turned into a, what amounts to a, a multinational uh, domestic, multicultural, I should say, domestic empire. Uh, I mean, it's not united. You know, <clears throat> it wasn't so long ago, 50 years ago, that Americans generally shared traditions, ideals, uh, ideas, the way things are done. Uh, it was a reasonably cohesive country. But now, uh, it's it's become very divided uh, religiously and ethnically and racially. Uh, now it's 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 going to come up part at the seams, which is unfortunate because the United States, uh, or I should say America, which is different, uh, was one of the best ideas that people have ever had. It was a unique country. It was a wonderful country. Well, they all had problems, but it was better than any other. And I, I've been to 155 countries uh, most many times, and I've lived in uh, 10 or a dozen. I have to count them up. Mm -hmm. uh, and the U.S. is great, but not as great as it used to be. It's falling rapidly. Well, I don't see, uh, Doug, I'm in a strange place, and I think some of the people that are listening and watching are as well. I'm one of those people where I don't, want to infringe upon anyone else i don't care what anyone does you know don't harm an animal don't harm a child i mean those are probably those are the only ways would consider the interference but i want to be left the hell alone i don't want to interfere with people but that's considered to be extreme in a lot of ways so if you are one of those individuals who does not want to harm other people who does not wish to do any harm or interfere are there are there any countries out there that are becoming um that are uh, that we'd say would be good for people like that could be people who um who have the american spirit of old that uh you know that have america of old in their hearts is there any countries out there that ha that that are kind of um, becoming new places where uh the old america will maybe re reconverge in a new land new land well <clears throat> regrettably uh i don't think i think that the whole world at this point is going in the wrong direction uh, there's no country in the world that I can put my finger on that's going in the right direction, uh, certainly. Uh, why, why might that be? Uh, it's because the kind of ideas which uh, have been infiltrated into uh, American colleges and high schools, and for that matter, at this point, grade schools, uh, they've spread all around the world like a poisonous miasma. So that's one thing. Uh, that's that's going on around the world. Uh, no, there's really there's really no place. Uh, I at this at this point you're better off if you're interested in personal freedom, uh, living in a uh, semi backward third world country, uh, because the government will have less resources and will be less in a position to monitor you than it is here in the U.S. I mean, here in the U.S., we live in uh, what's, what's been called a panopticon, where every place you go, uh, cameras are on you, your voices are being recorded, monitored by the NSA and God knows how many other agencies. But in uh, backward, poorer countries, uh, they're not in a position to do that as effectively. So that's one thing. Uh, and uh, there are other advantages to uh, living in a more backward country. What was the uh, backward country? Like, I mean, it, maybe people want to entertain the idea, but maybe they, they'd also want to say, okay, well, I'm all about, you know, having the freedom, but I just want to make sure that, you know, they have like decent medical, uh, medical care or they have decent running water. So um, is there a happy medium that you can get there where you can find a country that is like, you know, got the basic necessities that you need or a certain standard quality of necessities, medical care, food, um, but it also it doesn't over infringe upon you. 
Well, I'm very familiar with Latin America, uh, among other places. And um, I live uh, officially and in reality in uh, Uruguay most of the time. Uh, uh, and Argentina as well. And uh, the medical care, Uruguay is a small country, only three and a half million people. Uh, Argentina has uh, a huge panoply of problems, but uh, the medical system there is quite good. Uh, and if anything goes wrong, I needed an emergency appendectomy a few years ago. And the uh, treatment that I got in Buenos Aires, I've got to say, I can't imagine it having been better any place in the world, quicker and non-bureaucratic and cheap as well. So uh, I wouldn't worry about uh, that too much. I'm not talking about moving to the Congo or Equatorial Guinea. That's a different kettle of fish. And uh, countries like that present other advantages. And in fact, I've also said for years that if I was in my 20s or my 30s uh, and I didn't have much money, but I wanted to become wealthy as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. I would go to Africa, for instance. Nobody ever thinks of that. Nobody ever thinks of Africa uh, for a lot of good reasons. But uh, there are good reasons to think of places like Africa. Why? Because uh, I like to play. I don't believe in playing on a level playing field when I'm playing. If possible, hmm. I want to be on a playing field tilted to my advantage. And if a young guy, and generally speaking, uh, you want to be a young guy, not a girl, for a, hmm. just a lot of genetic reasons in a place like Africa. Um, he, you'll have advantages just by virtue of having been born and raised in the U.S. and just absorbing through osmosis the things that we have here in the U.S. You'll know people uh, and have connections um, that put you... Uh, way ahead of the average African. And you'd be unusual. You'd be the, uh, the, the outsider in town. Everybody's going to wonder who you are. And, you know, I've done this in, in many countries. It used to be my modus operandi. Go to a country that I hadn't been to before, call up the lawyers and the real estate agents, who are generally the people that uh, know everybody, and where all the money flows through, all the power flows through. Those are two good things. I used to go to art galleries too, because I'm interested in art. And uh, you know, the power people in those countries generally are interested in art too. So there are things you can do. And I would interview people for a couple of days. And after a couple of days, I'd be, you know, get along well with some of them, get invited home to, you know, come on, have dinner with the family tonight. Oh, we're having an interesting party at so-and-so's house tonight. Come on over things like that. And uh, if you're, a, uh, if you're a, a young American who uh, knows his way around and is presentable and knowledgeable and so forth, has done something with his life, let's say, mm -hmm. as much as you can in your 20s, or early 30s, I mean, you can be sitting down with the president of most African countries within a month. So Sounds awesome. incredible. Just, yeah. just arriving in town. I mean, it's, it's uh, so that's one kind of third world country. That's not what I'm talking about in another context. A context. Where do you move? Because there are lots of disadvantages to being in really backward places like in Africa or the, or the, or the Pacific, for that matter. But uh, see, the thing is, is people have got to, uh, most Americans... We're only 4% of the world's population, which is pretty shocking. Americans are only 4%. Yeah, they were all over. It's yeah. I mean, we're, we're a pretty small minority. But um, we've been so lucky that we feel that the whole world revolves, or that America is the whole world. You don't have to leave America, you know. I think that's a mistake because uh, if you start acting like a plant, glued to one place, that's not a very good survival strategy for uh, a human being. You don't want to be like an, a medieval peasant who's afraid to 
uh, go to some foreign site because you heard that there might be dragons over that hill. So um, I remember talking to um, Jim Rogers and Jim Rogers used to take a motorcycle. I think he had set a Guinness world record of driving his motorcycle through so many different countries. And he had said one time that some of his, uh, I guess a lot of his business sense comes through by meeting people all the time, by introducing and learning new cultures. And there's one thing, I mean, I'll tell you this, uh, Doug, I, I, would, I, I would love to do this. I would love to just be around people that share some of the same values. When I say same values, just to recognize the fact that, okay, you know, everyone here can cooperate and we don't have to infringe upon each other. And, you know, we just have the value that, you know, we're, we're all here and that we all have a job to go to. We all have families that we want to take care of. And it's good that, you know, that we share these values that we, you know, we want to help each other. It seems that it's completely obliterated. Everything is so politically polarized in the U.S. And some of these values that they're pushing on, I cannot for the life of me, Doug, understand why so many Americans go on board with the sexualization of children. I think it is something that is the most sinister, most evil thing. And I wonder if this is a hallmark of when cultures collapse, because I wonder if the Roman Empire or some of these other cultures collapse when the people collectively speaking engage in certain behaviors that are just deplorable or maybe this is just where the u.s is evolving to maybe the u.s was destined to go this way maybe it's going to continue i'm just curious about that in your perspective if nations tend to stay together that have quote unquote stronger more values at least treat each other respectfully or if when they treat each other terribly especially the children that that is a inclination that they're about to collapse yeah well <clears throat> First of all, as far as, as Jim Rogers is concerned, we've been friends for about 40 years. I mean, a long time. We agree about almost everything. We try to get together at least once a year. Uh, so I recommend that uh, all of our listeners uh, buy and read Jim's books. They're well right. worthwhile, all of them. Uh, as far as the moral collapse of the U.S. Oh, I think it's definitely happening. And it, it, I guess it's to be expected because when you have a lot of money and a lot of power, uh, this has an effect on your psyche uh, as a country and as an individual that's living in that country. So it's kind of inevitable. It's the uh, perhaps the practical application of the second law of thermodynamics, which basically holds that everything falls apart over time. Everything degrades over time. That's what the second law basically says in many forms. So it's natural enough that, uh, that the mighty fall and become corrupt eventually. And uh, well, you can see it happening in the US. For instance, I'm not a religious person, okay? But, uh, you know, I respect the value that, uh, that religion imparts to people. It, uh, it gives them some kind of moral guidelines to adhere to. Maybe they're not very good at adhering to them, but at least they'll pay lip service to them and they know yeah. what they are. But um, that's pretty much vanished from American life, certainly in the coastal cities. You go out into the hinterlands, where I happen to be right now here in the U.S., because I'm talking to you from the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, they're much more prevalent, but they're fading away because the people that go to these churches and listen to the preachers say whatever he's saying, they're generally, you know, basically sound, decent things. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of uh, being eroded by or things that they hear on television, for instance, and in mass entertainment, which are antithetical. So yeah, of course, the moral fabric of the US is uh, not just changing, but it's degrading. No question about it, actually. Okay, and we get to that point where um, I guess that the, the collapse happens. What can people do that are in the US that 
don't want to be a part of this. Don't want to be part of this collective um, death cult, if you want to call it, because it seems that's what it is. I feel like it is a death cult. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, 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 I, it's it's so weird too because I don't think that um, I don't know. I remember when I was growing up, I just had a high school reunion, Doug, and I remember talking to the people that are there, and they were all like, you know, they're all entrepreneurs. Most of them are entrepreneurs, and they they all had like a lot of these values. So I, I feel very lucky that I grew up with the. Um, values, you know, pro freedom values, and they seem to be really respectful, but it's gone. So, how do you live and even thrive in a country like the U.S. that is morally degrading and that it seems to be tyranny will increasing, will only be increasing? How do you how do you do that, or do you just leave? Is it now time to leave, or um, what if you have to stay because you have family? Well, it's getting harder and harder. You're right, uh, Ryan. It's getting harder and harder to be an effective entrepreneur in the U.S. because you have to ask permission and pay fees and uh, observe regulations, most of which are stupid or meaningless. <laughs> so it's, it, it's, it's becoming actually harder and harder to become uh, an entrepreneur. And uh, so what do you do about that? Well, I guess most people say, oh, screw it. I'll just get a job and do what I'm told and live in my cubicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, listen, as powerful as the government is getting, and the government is has been run by actual Jacobins, certainly since Biden's been elected. These people that, that control the US government from Washington, DC there, exactly the same personality types, the same psychology, the same philosophical beliefs that the Jacobins that took over France uh, after the revolution are, or for that matter, the Bolsheviks that took over Russia in 1917, or for that matter, uh, the Red Guards that took over uh, Mao's China in the late 60s, the same profile type people. And the problem is, is once these horrible people get control of the apparatus of the state, it's really hard to get rid of them. They cement themselves in office. And about the only way you can get rid of them is a, a revolution or a complete collapse. I mean, couldn't get rid of the Bolsheviks and, until Soviet society collapsed in the uh, in uh, 1990, uh, couldn't get rid of those, get get rid of the Jacobins uh, until Napoleon came and established something even worse, a military dictatorship. Um, so, what's going to happen here in the U.S.? Yeah. I think it's going to get wild and woolly throughout this decade, for in lots of ways. We can count the ways. It's going to get wild and woolly. What should you do? I guess was your question. Yeah, I mean, what can you? Do? I mean, what can you do? Because one thing I'm working on, Doug, is I'm working on um, something where I want to ask a bunch of people that are prepared minded about certain states that would have the most freedom, or where you can go to. One of my um, a gentleman, a friend of mine, he says, you know, Florida's great freedom, but it's like the worst state to be in, especially if they have uh, a grid down situation. He's like, that's like the worst place to be, and he wouldn't want to go to Florida. But even though there's a lot of people out there, so. Um, I'm just, you know, curious if, if there are states that people should be moving to right now, or there, um, or what can people do? Because uh, I love the idea of um, people, you know, having their own business, and should they be starting different companies, and um, you know, or they should should they be working for themselves? Should they be growing food? Like, what are some of the ways that you can really protect yourself or insulate yourself from this hmm. chaos that's coming? The United States, from many points of view despite what I've said so far, mm -hmm. is still the, the, among the easiest places to make money, uh, to set something up and to become a, uh, an entrepreneur. Because let's say I'm, I live you know, a good part of the year in Uruguay. Uh, if, if I didn't have any money, I wouldn't move to Uruguay unless I just wanted to live a quiet and peaceful life, because uh, there isn't an entrepreneurial culture in the country, okay? And I can get by in Spanish, but my Spanish is not good enough to uh, make it possible for me to effectively 
be an entrepreneur and, and run a business, even though in most countries in the world today, uh, the kind of people that you'll probably want to deal with, which is to say uh, the educated and wealthy people, they all speak English. It, some of them as well are better than you and I do, quite frankly. So uh, it's not impossible, but uh, sure, there's advantages to being in the U.S., but um, you know, increasingly, it's uh, it's it's not a question of setting up a business where you produce and create new wealth. That's ideal. That's what we want to see. Mm. But uh, th we're moving into the age of the speculator, as opposed to the uh, entrepreneur or the investor. Hard to it's harder and harder to be an entrepreneur. It's becoming harder and harder, really hard, to be an, an investor where there is so much financial and economic chaos being created by the state. But on the other hand, if we live if we lived in a real free market society, which we don't, uh, there would really be no speculators. Why? Because a speculator is somebody who looks and finds distortions in the market, finds stupidities. Uh, in the market, and positions himself to take advantage of them. So, uh, you know, this is a fairly good time to be a speculator, uh, which is uh, a noble profession. I <laughs> I consider myself a speculator, but one, as I said, if we lived in a free market society, I would be chronically unemployed as a speculator. So, I think you've got to look in that in that direction. Sure. Are there other professions or businesses that work great for anarcho capitalists for people that you know really want to be kind of off the grid, but also need to make money to sustain themselves? Well, or even I, professions like I, for that minded. Like I said, if, if I was in my twenties, yeah, or 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 even early thirties, thirties, I would uh, go someplace where I'm an like I said before, where I'm on an on level playing field. Okay where uh, just because of where I've been and what I have and who I am, uh, I, I'm ahead of 99 out of 100 of the other bears on the field. Okay, so that's what you gotta do, uh, I, I think. Okay. I mean, that's, that's the way you've gotta think and look. I don't think it's a good idea, no matter who you are, to stay in your town or village or small city and uh, stay there like a plant. I mean, at a minimum, you know, move to New York or Chicago or LA and, you know, start bumping into people, as many people as you can. But if you stay in Podunk, it's not gonna do you much good. Okay, I think it's an excellent idea. You Doug, uh, you know, people know, a lot of things about you, but I'm sure that they, they should know more about some of your books that you've written. You've written these uh, Assassin's Book, uh, one of the recent ones, Assassin Book Three, the High Ground Novels. And I love the fact that you you write fiction. And, you know, there are two other famous works of fiction, 1984, Animal Farm. And there was a movie that came out in 2006 called Idiocracy. And these works of fiction all seem to be prophecies about what was going to happen in the U.S. So, I'm curious, uh, based on you know your perspective, do you find that why is it so interesting that works of fiction are now becoming a reality? It's it's. Do you think that the, the powers that be like kind of look at these books and say, you know, those are actually great ideas, because it's just very strange about how the line between fantasy and reality is completely blurred, and things that you thought were surreal or could never happen even two years ago are now happening. It's just it's a very strange time. So. I'm wondering uh, where, where that life finally comes, where fiction is, is reality. Yeah, I'm afraid that life really is starting to uh, imitate art. <laughs> it actually it actually is in, in lots of ways. Uh, maybe it always has, but now more than ever. I think the other book that you were probably had in the back of your mind was uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Yeah. And... Uh, if anybody hasn't read those two books, uh, they should read them both, 1984 by uh, Orwell and Brave New World by Huxley. Uh, they're both about dystopias, 
and they're they're equal. They're both horrible. I mean, good reads, but <laughs> describing a horrible worlds, and they're equally and very different from each other, but equally likely. In fact, we're getting a combination of both. You know, a nasty Stalin-esque type police state uh, in the mold of 1984, and um, Brave New World is one where uh, <laughs> it's more complex, but uh, mm -hmm. we're basically, uh, you know, the you got to you you got to read them both. I can't. I they're can't. horrific. Yeah, you know, they're absolutely they're 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 horrific, and they, they kind of give you an idea about what's happening in China. I'm most surprised that have they have a social credit rating system. They think that will will succeed in the U.S. Oh, it's it's definitely on its way. I mean, my understanding is that the younger generations uh, like to compare their um, their um, what are these scores that banks give you for credit you, credit scores credit uh, scores uh, and so forth. That's that's horrible. I mean, yeah. uh, they're waste. Nah, I'm not gonna. It, it is it, they. Look, they're all on Facebook or Twitter or, you know, a dozen other things like this where everybody thinks that they know everything about everybody else. Uh, privacy is really not valued. In fact, no. it's the opposite of being valued. It's suspicious if you, um, if you want to have financial or any other type of privacy today. I think that the world has become uh, very different. And in this case, it's become very corrupt for the reasons that I've been talking about earlier, even in this interview. The, the trend is not good. It's not good anywhere. So what should you do? Mm -hmm. uh, look, the, there are many paths up the mountain, but the bottom line is this. Uh, you want to... Uh, become as wealthy as you can and whatever that context may mean for an individual it's different things to different people uh because having money having capital uh lets you insulate yourself from these horrible things on the outside you know it's helpful if you don't have any money i mean you're really just chaff being blown by the wind so number one work harder at your job. In fact, take two jobs. Uh, you'll spend less money, you'll earn twice as much money, and save your money. Well, how do you save your money? Well, I don't think holding dollars right now is a good idea. I mean, did you buy silver coins in that way and just take the money and just convert it? To... I would right. I'll definitely buy silver coins. Silver is, silver is a very good value right now at $20 an ounce. Uh, gold, as we speak, is what, $17.50, something like that. Uh, I've been buying gold ever since it was $40 an ounce. Oh, wow. So, I mean, not as a speculation. I mm -hmm. thought it was going up, but I've just been buying it because, well, I'd like to set aside some capital to use that capital later. Uh, and I still have that, that savings cushion. I, I don't need it. I've got quite a bit of it. But uh, everybody should do that. Uh, have uh, capital in a form that's private, which gold coins are, silver coins are, um, uh, and uh, likely to go up, at least keep, keep pace with the debasement of the currency, but probably go up uh, faster than retail inflation. You know, that's, uh, that's what you want to do today. I mean, uh, gambling in the stock market, and most people that are most people think they're investing in the stock market uh, or think they're speculating. They're not. They're gambling, but they don't know it. And that's the worst kind of gambling when you're gambling and you don't even know you're gambling. Uh, and at this point, uh, I'm not optimistic about the stock market. We've had a huge, huge bull market for the last 40 years. This is almost unprecedented, almost unprecedented. Certainly, the for the reasons that the stock market's gone up so so much, uh, the bond market—I mean, that's a genuine accident waiting to happen. 
interest rates have doubled in the last year. But regardless of the Federal Reserve does, uh, which shouldn't exist, incidentally. But I agree with you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Ron Paul's work, right? Exactly. So I just love to ask you just two more quick questions. One of them is, do you foresee, I mean, we're talking about a lot of um, negative things that are currently happening, the trajectory of things. It seems that they're really trying to push that great reset. Because if you listen to what some of these people in various governments say, they're all kind of saying the same thing. So it, it seems very you know, coordinated. Do you believe that that great reset will succeed um, will it, um, worldwide? Will it succeed in other countries? Will certain countries be uh, susceptible to it? Because I'm looking at the U.S. right now, and I see certain states that are completely on board, like New York is going to just get rid of all uh, cars. I guess they, they, they're going to only have electric cars by a certain date, and California's like that. A bunch but, of states are saying things like that, right? You know. So I do you think that the the great reset is going to succeed on a worldwide scale or is it um if it if it doesn't reach a worldwide scale does that mean it's a failure so well, this, is, this is a concept the concept of the great reset is one that's been put forth by something called the world economic forum uh it's run out of switzerland and was founded by a guy named klaus schwab horrible human being yeah. and being widely promoted now by somebody who's become quite a uh uh, who, who's been the court intellectual of the World Economic Forum. Uh, and his name is uh, Noah Yuval Harari. Uh, and he's written books promoting the concept of a great reset. Uh, it's absolutely shocking. Uh, what, what the World Economic Forum is, is it's a, uh, it's a meeting where anybody who is anybody practically in the world of finance or politics uh, and influential rich people get together and decide what they think the rest of the world should do. It's, it's quite amazing, the, uh, uh, the WEF. And I, I wrote an article about this in internationalman.com last week, I think, uh, decrying it. Yeah, they're really, uh, look, I'm not a conspiracy guy, uh, frankly, but when you see things going on almost everywhere at the same time, like this mm -hmm. recent pandemic hysteria that we had, I mean, this was something that was, you know, criminally, criminally insane. Yeah. But almost everybody seems to, you know, the, you know sort of wearing their masks like good little sheep. <laughs> you know, there's that, and and now this war in the Ukraine, which we could, we could, we could talk about, where you know Vladimir Putin, who's not a particularly good guy, but there are no world leaders that are particularly good guys. They're all basically the scum of the earth that rise to the top. But he's become the devil incarnate, mm -hmm. you know, and and the Ukraine is the world's noblest nation, actually. It's one of the world's most backward and corrupt nations, <laughs> but it's now our new best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a lot of scary stuff going on in the world. So like I said, look, what, what do you do about it? You, uh, you double your hours of working, you double or triple or quadruple your savings, you put them in the right form, you um, read a lot, educate yourself, and uh, try to make the best of it, because this has become a uh, uh, what the French call a sauve qui peut. In other words, situation means every man for himself. Uh, this decade is going to be chaotic and unpleasant, and it's just started. Oh, we, haven't had the, we haven't had the financial collapse yet, which we will. When we say financial collapse, I mean... Martin, to bring back Martin Armstrong again, he says that the U.S. is not, we're not going to experience hyperinflation because the, there's just too many dollars that are out there. And I think he said that the, there is going to be a crisis, but he said inflation would be at 25% maybe by the end of this year, um, or by the end of the, even 2024. But do you think we'll have a full-fledged hyperinflationary depression in the U.S. where you know all dollars will become worthless? How do you foresee the uh, financial crisis playing out? Well, ultimately, ultimately, the dollars, it's just a fiat. It's just paper printed up arbitrarily at this point. 
by the trillions by the US government. Will it be a hyperinflation? Oh, very possibly. But first, we could have a catastrophic deflation, where because of all the debt in the world, if it's not uh, serviced, it collapses. And you know, a billion dollars worth of assets, you default on it, companies bankrupt. Uh, it could be this, uh, this, this stupid crypto con uh, company, FTX, the one that yeah. collapsed. That's what, you could have that times a thousand going on. And yeah, it would turn into a yeah. deflation where instead of having too much depreciating money, you have not enough money at all because your bank goes bust and, and you wind up with nothing. Uh, look, the one thing that seems certain to me is we're going to have chaos, financial chaos. What form it's going to take, inflation, deflation, they're both possible. They're both possible at the same time in different areas of the economy or in sequence. So uh, it's not good. So Doug Casey, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. We'll know about Doug by going to his website, internationalman.com. And also please check out his books where we'll post links to Doug, this was the truth that we needed to hear. And I just want to say how thankful we are that you shared your insight and your time with us. It was a pleasure talking to you, Ryan. Thank you.